Now we extend the analysis of non-linear functions by beginning to illustrate the use of differential calculus. This is an essential tool for economists because in many areas of economics, we're interested in the speed of change of functions as a means of dealing with economic problems. We'll look at two simple examples here and develop further examples in our final film in order to extend our understanding of differential calculus. Our first problem comes from the world of microeconomics. When companies make decisions about pricing, how do they do it? A perfectly competitive firm has no choice. In many agricultural markets, the price is determined by supply and demand. The firm accepts the price and makes a decision about its level of output. But frequently, firms have a degree of monopoly power, for example in oil, in many manufacturing processes, in the travel industry. Because a firm faces a downward sloping demand curve, it will have some control over price. One crucial consideration for firms is the effect that decisions have on their revenue, the income received for selling their goods. It isn't the only factor because they have to consider costs of production, but revenue is important. We may want to know what price and output maximizes revenue. For example, managers may believe that their salary is positively correlated to the revenue the firm makes rather than to profit. In some industries, governments may be interested in revenue maximization. In tobacco, a large part of revenue goes to government in taxes. If the government focuses on the health of its citizens, it may want a very high price to deter consumption. But if it wishes to maximize its tax take, then knowing the price and output at which revenue is maximized is important. After all, the government can drive the industry towards that level by its tax policy. How can differential calculus help us to find the output at which revenue is maximized? Here we shall find out the tax rate, the amount of tax on a cask of wine, that would maximize the tax take for the government. To do so, we'll use the equations that we had in film two. The tax per cask, T, is an additional cost to suppliers. Now the supply curve originally was P equals a half QS plus 20. Now we subtract the tax from the price that the supplier will receive. So we have P minus T equals half QS plus 20. So P is now half QS plus 20 plus T. What's the effect on market equilibrium? Well, the demand for wine is unaffected. It's the same as before. We still have P equals minus 2QD plus 40. So the new equilibrium will be where supply equals demand. And that's given as half Q plus 20 plus T equals minus 2Q plus 40. So a half Q equals minus 2Q plus 20 minus T. 5 over 2Q equals 20 minus T. So Q equals 8 minus 2 fifths T. Now we wish to maximize government revenue that we'll call capital T. So little t is the tax rate. Capital T is the amount of government revenue from the tax. Now T, capital T, is the quantity of wine produced multiplied by the tax rate, little t. So capital T equals little t q. In this case, capital T equals little t 8 minus 2 fifths times little t. 
So if we multiply out the brackets, that gives us 8t minus 2 fifths t squared. Now, because we're interested in maximizing government revenue, we need to find where d capital T by d little t equals zero. 8 minus 4 over 5 little t equals zero. So t equals 10. Now let's confirm that this really is a maximum and not a minimum, since d capital T by d little t is equal to minus 4 fifths, that is to say less than zero, this must be a maximum, not a minimum rate. So the optimum tax rate on wine, given our supply and demand functions, is 10 euros if the object is to maximize revenue. Any tax in this market reduces the equilibrium quantity, but any tax above 10 euros will reduce government revenue.